You're listening ad-free on Wondery Plus. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. It was closing time for the employees of Olay's Home Center in South Pasadena, California. It was just before 8 p.m. on October 10, 1984, and employees of the store were cleaning up and getting ready to go home. It had been relatively quiet that night. The World Series was happening, and people were staying in to watch the San Diego Padres take on the Detroit Tigers. But there had been a rush of last-minute shoppers. 50-year-old Ada Deal, her husband, and their two-year-old grandson, Matthew, had run into the store to get a few supplies. The family split up so they could get out fast before the store closed. As Ada and Matthew walked toward the paint department, smoke began to creep across the ceiling, then rapidly fill up the room. A 19-year-old employee, Jim Obden, heard an emergency announcement over the PA system warning people about the fire. Jim began to corral customers toward the doors to the outside. At first, he wasn't worried. The only indication of a fire was the pillar of dark smoke. So when Jim first encountered Ada Deal and her grandson in the paint section, he told them not to be alarmed, but that they needed to leave. He started to guide them to the exit, but quickly noticed they were not behind it. He found them again, still in the same aisle, and this time he demanded they follow him. But as he tried to lead them to a fire door, he was blocked by a wall of flames. And then the store lights went out. With smoke blinding him, Jim lost track of Ada and Matthew. Finally, he found an exit and escaped. Jim was severely burned, but he was alive. Four others were not so lucky. Ada and Matthew Deal and two employees of Olay's perished in the fire. Investigators at first believed the fire was accidental until revered arson investigator John Orr, who just happened to be passing by the scene when the fire occurred, put forth a different theory, arson. And he, of all people, should know. This was just one of the nearly 2,000 fires that John Orr, also known as the Pillow Pyro, was responsible for. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed many murderers, serial killers included, and the question I get asked time and time again is why they did what they did. It's difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into the killer's mindsets. So in this series, I will do just that and give you my best analysis of what made them do what they did. This episode is John Orr, The Pillow Pyro. October 10th, 1984 was an unusually busy night for the firefighters in Southern California's San Gabriel Valley. About two and a half hours before the Olay's fire, There was a blaze at an Albertsons grocery store seven miles away. And then, at the same time as the Olay's fire, a Vons grocery store located on the same street as Olay's was also burning. The fact that the firefighters were being forced to fight fires at multiple locations simultaneously impaired their ability to quickly put out the Olay fire. The fire captain that responded to the Olay scene first described a very strange hiss coming from the fire. The flames were also bluish green and had very little smoke. 
The main issue was how fast the fire was moving. The firefighters were helpless to stop it. The night of these three fires, arson investigator John Orr showed up to Olay shortly after the blaze started. And even though he was not assigned to the case, he began to take pictures. He told the firefighters he had just left the Albertsons' grocery fire scene, and since he was a respected investigator, no one questioned him. Within a few days, the sheriff's department declared the Olay's fire was an accident caused by faulty wiring. John's claims that the fire was arson were dismissed. However, a few days later, another blaze erupted at a business in North Hollywood. This time, the point of origin was traced back to merchandise made of polyurethane foam, or polyfoam. This is the kind of foam used in couch cushions and mattresses and is basically frozen petroleum, and it is highly flammable. When burning, it emits a bluish-green flame, and it also causes a strange hissing sound when it burns. The similarities between the fires were more than a coincidence, and any seasoned investigator will tell you they don't believe in coincidences. When investigators assigned to the case continued to label the Olay's fire as accidental, John Orr went to the relatives of some of the people killed at Olay's and shared with them how disappointed he was about that conclusion. He pointed out the similarities between the other fires and encouraged them to pressure law enforcement to investigate further. To say the least, doing this was highly irregular. After these initial fires in 1984, fires that were eerily similar began occurring in California over the next few years, all of them set with similar materials. But investigators were stumped when they tried to figure out the device causing them, or even if they were all directly connected. Until January of 1987, when Captain Marvin Casey, a fire investigator with the Bakersfield Fire Department, discovered a device in a Craft Mart store. The fire at that store was extinguished before it got out of control. And what Captain Casey found there was a cigarette with three matches wrapped up in a rubber band. With it, he found a scrap of yellow lined paper, and that piece of paper had a fingerprint on it. Unfortunately for Casey, fingerprint technology was not as advanced as it is today. And at that time, the fingerprint search did not yield a suspect. However, due to the arsonist's advanced techniques, and the fact that the fires were often in the vicinity of a professional conference of fire investigators, Casey believed the arsonist might just be a fellow fire investigator. Why else would he think that? Because the person setting these fires knew what they were doing. The device used to set the fires, a timed incendiary fuse, and where the points of origin were located told him that the arsonist had superior knowledge on what would make the fires the most devastating. However, at that time, Casey had no proof and no suspect. From late 1990 through March of 1991, the Los Angeles area was blitzed by 24 arsons or arson attempts, all targeting retail stores and in broad daylight. The arsonists would usually set brush fires first in less populated areas. He did that to draw firefighters away from congested areas. That made the fires in city areas more difficult to contain. To apprehend the arsonists, a task force was formed called the Pillow Pyro Task Force, referencing the numerous in-store fires that had been set in pillows. When the task force started to cross-reference the current fires with past unsolved retail fires, they noticed a striking similarity between them. The task force soon connected with Captain Casey, who shared his theory that an arson investigator was responsible for the crimes. With fingerprint technology having vastly improved in the past few years, they re-ran the fingerprint Casey had found a few years earlier at a crime scene. 
There was now a match, and the reveal was stunning. It was one of their own, John Orr. As the task force began secretly investigating Orr, they found out that he was writing a book called Point of Origin. In this book, the main character is an arson investigator who is also an arsonist named Aaron Stiles. This is an anagram for I Start L.A. Arson. While the book is supposedly fiction, the fires set by Aaron are extremely similar to the Pillow Pyro's fire. And when I say extremely, I mean almost identical. Even more damning were letters he wrote to literary agents, citing details about active arson investigations, including arsons that had not been linked to the Pillow Pyro, details that only the arsonist would know. The task force began a months-long, very intense and meticulous physical surveillance of their subject. Their patience paid off, and after watching Orr for several months, they actually caught him lurking at a fire site at the beginning of a suspicious fire. They arrested John Orr on that day, December 4th, 1991, for serial arson and murder. So who is John Leonard Orr? He was a native Angelino born on April 26, 1949. John and his two brothers grew up in a house behind his grandparents' house, and he describes it as a traditional happy childhood. This all changed when John was 16, after his mother left the family home inexplicably. He didn't see her again for nearly three years. Since his older brothers had already moved out of the house, John was left to live with his heartbroken father. When John was very young, he watched firemen trying to save a friend's home. From that moment forward, John was fascinated by them. So during career day at his high school, John spoke with a captain in the Los Angeles Fire Department. The captain told him that to be a firefighter, military experience was just as good as a fire science degree. So he took the captain's advice and joined the Air Force. The Air Force allowed him to enter their firefighting school, where he received his first training as a fireman. In 1968, John married his high school sweetheart, Jody, and they moved to Spain for two years. He had been assigned to a base near an airport, but to John's complete disappointment, he only got to respond to two air crashes while there. When the Air Force transferred him to Montana, his firefighting bug was again not satisfied and only got to fight one minor fire while stationed there. John was honorably discharged from the Air Force at 22 years old. At that time, Jody was pregnant with their first child. In later interviews, John says that he was very bitter and resentful of authority after he left the military. He believes that this was caused by his own insecurity. Around the same time that his first daughter was born, he applied for jobs at all the Los Angeles fire and police departments. He considered these departments to be the best of the best. At the police department, he passed all the written tests and interviews, But when it came time for the psychological testing, he failed. This test included Rorschach testing and a 550-question MMPI, which stands for Minnesota Multifaceted Personality Inventory Test. The Rorschach test was introduced in 1921 by a Swiss psychiatrist named Herman Rorschach. It is a method of psychological testing in which the participant is shown 10 ink blots. Some are black and white, some have color. The participant is then asked to describe what they see. Their answers are used to determine the test taker's personality characteristics and emotional functioning. The test is often used to detect underlying thought patterns 
and to differentiate psychotic from non-psychotic dispositions in a person's thinking. It is also used to gauge a person's general degree of adjustment to society. Rorschach showed the inkblots to both healthy and mentally ill patients to observe which patterns emerged in their responses. He felt that it was a great diagnostic tool and the psychiatric community embraced it. This test is not so much about the specific things that test takers see as it is about our general approach to perception. The Rorschach test has been administered and used incorrectly by so many that the medical community began to discount it. For example, workplaces would use them to weed out candidates during job searches, but they really had no idea how to interpret the results. But a study in 2013 proved that when administered correctly, there is a lot to be learned from the test. Here's the thing. The test needs to be administered and interpreted by a trained psychiatrist or psychologist. Rorschach tests were not used for pre-employment testing at the FBI. As an inpatient clinical psychiatric nurse, these tests were not administered to our patients, ever. In my opinion, they are only good when it comes to determining a person's perception of reality. John's test results from the LAPD concluded that he was passive, low in conscientiousness, irresponsible, immature, indecisive, and had problems with women and sex. The MMPI portion of the test found that he had schizoid personality disorder, which is an emotionally unstable personality. Schizoid personality disorder is one of a group of conditions called Cluster A, or eccentric personality disorders. People with these disorders often appear odd or peculiar. They also tend to be distant, detached, and indifferent to social relationships. They are generally loners who prefer solitary activities and rarely express strong emotion. Considering what we've learned about John's four marriages in 10 years and his emotional detachment from his two daughters, it all fits perfectly. Although their names sound alike and they might have some similar symptoms, schizoid personality disorder is not the same thing as schizophrenia, which is a very serious thought disorder. Many people with schizoid personality disorder are able to function fairly well, although they tend to choose jobs that allow them to work alone, such as night security officer, librarian, or lab worker. Dealing with people on an ongoing basis and on an intense level is not their favorite thing. And I just described John Leonard Orr. John was devastated when he didn't pass the test. These emotions were compounded when he failed the physical requirements for the LA Fire Department. The day he was released, he was so upset he later said he felt paralyzed. By this time, his marriage was in trouble and John had two infant daughters. He needed to get a job and get it fast. So he applied to the Glendale Fire Department and was hired. On his off-duty days, he worked as a clerk at a 7-Eleven store. John left his wife and kids and moved in with a co-worker from 7-Eleven. John was outspoken in his dislike for police officers because he felt they never showed proper respect for firefighters. He began to take fire science and police science courses. He took the police course to gain report writing experience and to explore the conflicts between firemen and cops. But this was really just another way for John to continue his fantasy of becoming a police officer. John had never recovered from his rejection from the LAPD, and he still longed to be a cop. While he was working at 7-Eleven, John began to catch shoplifters and realized he had a knack for it. Soon, he began to chase shoplifters everywhere, not just his job, and he set his goal to become a security guard. This would be as close as he could get to becoming a cop. 
John was initially rebuffed because the security guards were all off-duty cops and not firemen. But finally, he was able to secure a position as a daytime security guard at a department store. He said, and I quote, I found that I had a cop's six cents. For those off-duty cops, it was just a job. For me, it was like hunting. I loved going to work. Catching shoplifters and petty thieves became John's passion, and he went above and beyond, and sometimes too far. He was known for getting into physical fights and chasing people much farther than he should have. However, he also did some good, catching 30 people for the police, including a shoplifting team that stole $30,000 worth of property. John obtained a concealed carry license and began carrying a weapon around. This earned him the reputation as a wannabe cop in both the local fire department and the police department. The Glendale cops also called him Clouseau after actor Peter Sellers' famous movie role, Inspector Clouseau, because he would lurk around and watch people, waiting for them to commit a crime. But John didn't care what they said. He was very happy to go the extra mile to catch real criminals. In his book, Fire Lover, A True Story, author Joseph Wambaugh relays an episode in John's security career when he tried to apprehend a car thief that was stealing a car. John was carrying a 45 caliber semi-automatic weapon, and he pointed it at the thief, yelling, Give it up, asshole! The thief instead jumped into the car and tried to speed off, clipping John with the front fender in the process. When the stolen car then crashed into two other parked cars, John threatened to shoot him, even cocking the hammer for effect. But the thief did not yield to him. A police officer heard John yelling and went to check it out. When the cop arrived, the car thief immediately surrendered. Wamba wrote that John questioned why the guy refused to give up to him even when he was about to be shot but gave up immediately when he saw the real cop. In everything that he did, John was overzealous. Later on, when he became a fire inspector, he would call brush abatement companies, pretending to be the owner of overgrown hillsides that had not complied with his request to clear the brush. He would make appointments for the properties to be cleared and then have the bill sent to the owner's address. The fact is, when John did that, he was perpetrating fraud, but he didn't care. John rewrote the outdated fire department manuals and was also published in the American Fire Journal for his expertise. He even taught fire safety courses. As a security officer, he would chase down anyone that he saw committing a crime and had become an annoyance to the police department for his constant citations. I think it was all to prove that he was just as good as a police officer and that they had made a mistake by rejecting him. John's tenacity helped him when he began to train as an arson inspector. He once again had to take the psychological test, but this time he passed. He enjoyed that he could carry a gun and other perks that police had. But this brought conflicted feelings and he knew that he wasn't really a cop. John wrote this, quote, There was never total approval. An arson investigator wasn't totally a firefighter or totally a cop. We were bastard children, especially to real cops. But I had news for them. I wasn't a wannabe. I was a cop, whether they wanted to believe it or accept it. Full-time arson investigators in the state of California are defined in Penal Code 830.37 as law enforcement officers. John was obsessed with proving himself to other law enforcement. John was able to catch many serial arsonists by attempting to get into the arsonist's head, essentially profiling them. After he caught his first pyromaniac, he became fascinated by them. Pyromania is pathological fire setting. People with this impulse control disorder will set fires intentionally and repeatedly and watch them burn. 
they do not set fires for monetary, social, political, or any other motivations. They are obsessed with fire and anything associated with fire. A pyromaniac may feel pleasure, gratification, or a release of inner tension or anxiety once a fire is set. John wrote this about pyromaniacs. The fire becomes a friend they can relate to. Their fires bring attention, friends, admiration as heroes, and self-esteem. Like a drug addict, one good score leads to the desire for another. For John, fire became not only his friend, but his equalizer. It gave him validity as an investigator. He was able to solve the questions that other investigators could not. But usually, because he was the one who created the fire in the first place. He craved the recognition that he received, and he had to continue to create these fires to keep the praise coming. From a behavioral or psychological perspective, he repeated the fire-setting behavior over and over again because he liked what it did for him. It was a positive force. It was intoxicating, like an unimaginable transcendent kiss. He was always looking for another one. But there was another component to this. He didn't just start one fire at a time. He would set multiple fires so that the firefighters were spread thin and could not effectively fight some of the blazes. Yes, John was a compulsive fire setter, but he wasn't stupid. He knew how to throw investigators off his scent. And another thing to note, John did not start the fires at three in the morning when the locations would be empty. He did it during the day when he knew people would be around. Why? Because John was a psychopath, which meant that his bad behaviors were constantly escalating. He did not care about the harm that might come to others from his crimes. And as all serial criminals do, he became careless. In regards to the Olay fire, did John intend to kill those four people? I don't think so, but by that point, he didn't care. He should have known that it was a distinct probability someone could die. John very much enjoyed the game of cat and mouse he played with those investigating the fires. When I have interviewed other criminals that engaged in these types of activities, they told me it made them feel superior, smarter than those that were trying to catch them. It's a way they can feel more powerful than those chasing them. It's also a great way to get caught. The fires that John set took a great deal of planning. He was very meticulous and took pride in his details. He had to, or he would be caught. This type of planning shows that he was highly organized. His thoughts were not scattered. There is a phenomena called Firefighter arsonist. This is a term used by the United States Fire Department. In a 2016 article, Edward Nordskog, an arson expert based in California, says firefighter arson is a recognized, ongoing problem, but it's difficult to know exactly how common it is because authorities don't keep records. He says, quote, there's roughly 100 firefighter arsonists convicted every year in North America, and all of them are serial arsonists, which means three or more fires. In an article in the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism's Chasing Fires, forensic psychologist N.G. Barrow divided arsonists into these categories. The for-profit arsonists, this is someone whose motive is destroying inventory or insurance fraud. The revenge arsonist, he's motivated to set fires out of rage. This type has an intense need to retaliate to gain satisfaction for himself. According to the United States Fire Association, these arsons can be divided into personal revenge and societal, institutional, and group retaliation. Another type is the hero. These are people who set fires just to rescue the victims. The hero thrives on excitement and attention. A subcategory of the hero is the firefighter arsonist. The firebug, also known as a pyromaniac, 
According to Beryl, this is a person who's excited by the adventure that fire brings. Firebugs are usually emotionally immature, an angry person who feels powerless. Arsonists, like the firebug, escalate the destruction their fires will cause over time. Firebugs are usually emotionally immature, an angry person who feels powerless. Arsonists, like the firebug, escalate their fires over time. There is a difference between pyromania and arson. Pyromania is a psychiatric condition based on impulse control, or lack of, whereas arson is a criminal act. It's usually done maliciously. Pyromania and arson are both intentional, but pyromania is strictly pathological or compulsive. Arson may not be. Although an arsonist can be a pyromaniac, most arsonists are not. They may, however, have other diagnosable mental health conditions. A person with pyromania may not commit an act of arson. Although they may frequently start fires, they can do it in such a way that is not criminal. Kind of like playing with matches on a grand scale. John would often tape record the fires. He would be there before the firefighters arrived and tape the pageantry of the fire engines arriving and the destruction afterward. Because of his job, it did not seem odd to people. But after he was arrested, they found tapes that he had recorded of a crime scene before anyone knew that the fire existed. He was most likely taping these crimes for the same reason that rapists and killers tape their crimes, so that they can relive the event over and over again. And this is one clue that John is a pyromaniac. In John's fictional novel, the main character is sexually gratified by the fires. If we assume that this character is truly based on John, then he would have a paraphilia known as pyrophilia. As a reminder, paraphilia is the experience of intense sexual arousal to atypical objects, situations, fantasies, behaviors, or individuals. Pyrophilia is when a person obtains sexual gratification from starting a fire. This is different from pyromania because pyromaniacs do not get any sexual pleasure when they start fires. Unlike the pyrophiliac, a pyromaniac's interest in starting the fires is not sexual. They do not start them solely for sexual gratification, even though sometimes the pyromaniac can become aroused during the fire. Pyrophilia is very rare and there are very few recorded cases. However, there could be an explanation for the very low number of recorded cases. It could be because someone with pyrophilia is afraid others might view them not as only an arsonist, but as a pervert. It's not unusual for a criminal who commits a sexual act in the process of committing a different crime to deny the sexual component. In their mind, it's one thing to be seen as a criminal. It's a totally different thing to be seen as a pervert. In John's case, there may be more than one dynamic to starting a fire. One of the pieces of evidence that the police came across during their search was a photo of a tracking device that the police had put on his car, which means John knew that the surveillance device was there. He knew that they were investigating him, and yet he still could not stop setting fires. That speaks to how powerful the compulsion to start fires was. Journalist A.J. Wiseman writes this about Orr in his article on Medium. Quote, John Orr was a walking contradiction. He despised authority because of the air of arrogance and superiority surrounding the people in those positions. 
yet had an overinflated ego far worse than those he hated. A federal jury convicted Orr of three counts of arson in July of 1992, sentencing him 30 years. Then six years later, he was convicted on four counts of first-degree murder with special circumstances and 20 counts of arson. He was sentenced to four concurrent life terms without parole for murder, plus an additional 21 years in prison for arson. The death penalty was a consideration for John, but after one of his daughters made a passionate plea to the jury for her father's life, they became deadlocked on the sentencing. That same daughter now says she wished she had not done this and has written a very gripping novel about her father called Burned. From 1984 to 1991, federal agents believe Orr was responsible for almost 2,000 fires. This included a 1990 fire in Glendale that burned 67 homes. John Leonard Orr is thought to be one of the most prolific serial arsonists of the 20th century. He is currently serving his life sentence at California State Prison in Sentinella. From Wondery and Treefort Media, this is Killer Psyche. Next week on Killer Psyche, I'll be covering Jodi Arias, the most hated woman in America. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Joshua Morales with Maxwell Carney. With research and editing assistance from Ellie Lightfoot. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are our production assistants, and the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. This series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. <laughs>